Okay. Frank, are you ready to be introduced? I am, especially All by right. you. All right. <laughs> All right. So Frank Frigo, a game strategy expert and two-time world champion, backgammon champion, 1994 and 2023. I was there. I believe I was there for the first one. In fact, I'm sure I was there for the first one. But this one, I remember. This one, I remember well. Frank's a very good friend of mine for a long time. Frank, where did you live when I met you? The horse. Uh, I was in living in I was living in Louisville then. Yeah, he was yeah. in Louisville when I first <laughs> because I used to go to a tournament in Louisville. Um, Frank is the co-creator of the first. You are now friends with Pure Biology. Oh. <laughs> of the first, I've lost my spot. Uh, the first sporting betting and gaming industries. Frank has also been featured as a keynote speaker at major universities and corporate events across the US. His work in decision science, critical thinking and sports anal analytics has been prominently featured in many major news media outlets, including ESPN, NFL Network, The New York Times, Fox Sports, Esquire, CBS, NBC, USA Today, Yahoo Sports, The Athletic, The Ringer. Anybody know what The Ringer is? And the Sport and the Showtime Network. He is the principal of F Squared. Consulting S LSC and proudly served as the co-director of the San Diego Backgammon Club. Please welcome my good friend Frank to talk to us today. I'm sure it will be very interesting. All right, Frank, let's hit it. Can I have a comment, please? Thanks, hey Frank, you don't know me, but I've been hearing about you for two years from my best guy friend, Bob Wachtel. And, you know, he's been telling me about your accomplishments and the book and the excitement of what you've brought to professional sports. And you guys, any of you that have ever watched an NFL game lately, you're seeing Frank's stuff in action. So thank you for being here. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, Bob is great. Bob is working on a book project with us. Um, so on, on the the work in sports analytics. My partner is Chuck Bauer, who maybe many of you know, is also a very accomplished backgammon player and uh, uh, an experimental physicist. And um, Bob is is working on a book project on um, our story of our trials and tribulations <laughs> and uh, and adventures through the uh, through the NFL to professional sports. Yeah, so I don't know if we, I was telling April earlier, I'm happy to do this somewhat informally. I did, I don't have a, a very particular agenda. I, sh I shared with Antoinette some topics we we could talk about because a lot of what I'm super interested in and and, and what I sort of weave together with Backgammon um, is decision science. And it's, I've done a lot of work in, in decision science and consulting in a, in a number of different industries, healthcare and education, but backgammon, I, I'm not sure if, if working in decision science has helped me more with backgammon or it's really been the other way around because backgammon is such a microcosm of so many things about the way we make decisions in life and in different industries. And it's, it's really fascinating. And I think it's probably a, a big part of the reason that the game interests me and I'm sure interests so many of us. So I'm I'm happy to kind of do a, a Q and A. We can talk about different facets of the game or experience. I know I shared with Antoinette that another passion of mine is 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 preparation and just being present in in the decision making process. Which is any of us who played backgammon for a while know how challenging that is. That it's an emotional game. Um, it has all this volatility and chaos which really can cloud judgment. And it's also what makes the game really fun. 
I mean, that's what that's it's exciting, it's volatile, but at the same time, that really um, can cloud our judgment. And it's something when I kind of started playing more seriously again in the last few years that I really looked into because I found that I had a certain standard of play when I was playing a computer in a quiet room, but I wasn't necessarily able to translate that really well across the board when I was playing in a tournament, when I had to travel a distance, maybe my sleep was disrupted, the room's noisy, you're dealing with a real live opponent and you know their behavior and all of those things kind of get in the way. And some players are better at it than others. And I, I realize there's kind of a gap between what sort of your theoretical baseline is for your capability with the game and what you actually can do over the board. And I've really tried to focus on that, to try, especially for myself, to know what my issues are, what I need to do to be able to perform better over the board. And um, I really try to get to the point where I look at every decision independently, almost like I'm looking at a book of quiz problems. So whatever preceded it or whatever I'm concerned about going forward, I, I try to focus at each individual decision and say, what's the available information and what can I do with that information to the best of my ability and try to keep these other factors out of my um, field of view, if you will, and to, to really sort of focus on making the best decision. Um, and that's not to say it's, you know, a, a robotic process per se, um, because you still have a live opponent. You need to know who you're playing and you need to know maybe what some of their behavioral tendencies are. But most of the information is on the board in front of you that you need to, to use to assess your decisions. And the more you can sort of focus on that without letting other things get in the way, the better off, you know, you'll be. And um, yeah, so that's that's become a, a very particularly strong interest for me over the last uh, over the last couple of years. Any, and by the way, anybody, if you want to just sort of jump in, raise your hand, any questions, we can kind of steer the topic or the moderators, anything you anywhere you'd, you'd like to go with that. I'm happy to talk about. I've, I've been playing for a few decades, so I'm happy to talk about any of that experience or um, you know, my journey and how the game has changed both, you know, before the bots and now after the bots. I see Abby Ackermans has her hand up. So go ahead, Abby. Uh, hi, hi Abby. Frank. How you doing? I'm doing well. Nice to, yeah, nice to hear from you. Uh, and I'm, this is great. This is really helpful for, to all of us. So thank you for coming and sharing this with everybody here. Um, one question I had was, you know, kind of transitioning from the casual player to more um, tournament player or soon want to be more tournament um, savvy is what do you think that the best way is to prepare yourself for, you know, stronger opponents and, you know, you mentioned like the noise in a room or in a, in a situation where it's just not your home and you're not playing against your family. So what do you think is the number one way to sort of prepare yourself for that? Well, I, I, I mean, I think first and foremost, the, the, the neural nets are so good. So, you know, if you're serious about the game, Extreme Gammon is just an absolute must. I mean, there's obviously other bots that are very good, but Extreme Gammon is, is so user friendly. And I always find that if I know I can play well against the bot, um, I know that there's really no, there aren't, there aren't any humans that play better than that. So if I feel like I can hold my own, then I sh that should give me a certain degree of confidence. Um, so I think that's just such a great um, learning tool. Um, and then, you know, I think just playing, the transition from playing online or against, you know, in front of your PC versus playing live, there's really no um, substitute for playing live over the board just to get into the flow of the game, you know, where you're, you're using clock. And by the way, for those of you that don't know, Abby's a fairly new player. She's playing in San Diego, just started with us recently. And I think she's going to be playing in LA, which is great. Um, so, I think, you know, like Abby, what you're doing, like going to the Wednesday tournaments and 
getting used to the flow of playing live with a with an opponent, rolling the dice. It's really important because it's one thing to look at a screen and every you know everything's right there in a very concise way in front of you. But when you're playing a board, you know, over a board, it's you have sort of a just different field of view and it's just a different flow to the game. So there's really no substitute for playing live and just getting used to that. And then I think. You know, with iPhones, I mean, a lot of people record their matches now, which is great. But what I really love to do is when I'm playing live, take, have my phone next to me, taking a photo of positions. And I like to not only put those in later on into Extreme Gamma to see what the correct move or cube decision might have been, but I like to remember what I was thinking about over the board. So if you do it, soon enough it's nice to 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 see the objective information from extreme gammon and then to remember how, what your thought process was as you were looking at that and where you may have gone astray oh maybe i didn't consider the race well enough and that sort of bridges that gap you, you know you, you think about what it's like to be in the flow of the game and then also having this you know more objective information to compare it to and sometimes you can sort of see what you might have been missing while you were sitting there. Maybe, you know, your clock was getting low, you were impatient, you didn't put as much focus on the race. Um, maybe you were bothered by the previous game or the previous role. I mean, no matter how disciplined we are, it, it gets in all of our heads if we had an unlucky streak that preceded some decision. And sometimes you recognize that um, when you do more objective analysis later on. So. Yeah, I, I'm giving you a long-winded answer, but I think the uh, I think just playing live is really important to to just get into the flow of that and get used to using the clock and so forth. Thank you. That's so helpful. Thank you. We have a question from Randy. Randy, would you like to unmute and ask your question? I think she's still muted. Randy, you're still muted. It looks like. You want to hit this, the mic button to unmute. Thank you. Okay. Here we go. Um, right. It's a little different than Zoom, so I couldn't figure it out. Um, so I have two questions um, that have to do with sort of the psychology of playing, um, which is, I think, what you're talking about. Um, one thing is the, um, I, I find I start getting angry if the other person is winning too much. <laughs> and then I double more than I should because I want to sort of get back at them, um, you know, and, and sort of show them kind of thing. So that's one thing. And then the other thing, which just happened this morning, is if I am playing someone who generally I play better than, I, um, I start to um, take more risks and um, not um, – I was playing someone this morning. I always beat him like five to nothing. Um, well, this morning he beat me five to nothing. Um, and I, I chatted on the chat. I wrote, you're getting much better. And he said, better than what? Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I just felt like an idiot. I was like, if I'd been actually like thinking of him as a real, you know, opponent, I, I wouldn't have done some of that. So just how do you, how do you kind of help yourself not to let your own psychology, you know, get in the way? It's, it's really hard. Uh, first of all, I, I have yet, I've been playing backgammon for a long time, and I have yet to meet the person who this game cannot get under your skin. I mean, some people wear it differently than others, not as outwardly, but it it's an emotional game. It, you know, your best laid plans get taken away. You lose a match to somebody that makes a move that was clearly inferior and you lose anyways. I mean, it's just, it's what makes it such a great game. Um, so it is really hard. Um, but I think if you can really stay in the moment, you know, the mindfulness of focusing on what you can control and not getting distracted with the things you can't control, it's a huge advantage because every player deals with this. And the more disciplined you are to just not, you know, I mean, there's a lot of superstitious backgammon players that I've met. They just know things are going against them. You know, <laughs> they just know that, you know, there's been a 
terrible unlucky sequence and it's going to continue and you know if you study randomness you know randomness looks very cynical at times that you just you know you get dealt some really rough dice at times and you've got to just continue to to you know look at everything uh independently and it's hard um but if you can do it you can really it makes a big difference in your results in the long term if you can really sort of focus on only the things that you have control over um you know and, and it goes it's two different directions it's what preceded your decision and also i find sometimes that i'll be making a decision and i'll be you know in the back of my head thinking oh man i just know this is going to go bad <laughs> Yeah. And that doesn't do me any good either, you know, even thinking forward about where things might go. Um, so, yeah, it's it's difficult, but it's uh, it's important. And, you know, it, it. It's a fun game. I mean, the emotion is part of the fun of the game. So, you you know, I, I don't want to make it sound like we should all be these robots and not have any enjoyment out of it. But there's a difference, I think, between embracing um the ebbs and flows of the luck of the game and then letting it affect your decision making process those are sort of two different things and um yeah so i think uh yeah, it's uh it's hard but it's uh you know you can you can chip away at it great thanks uh candace is next Hello, Candace. Long time no see. Uh, looks like she's still working on her audio issues. Yeah. Yeah. Candace, okay. sorry, I'm going to mute you again. I think um, you still have some audio issues to work on. Uh, sorry, Candace. Yeah, we can't hear you. Yeah, it's too it's too hard. So, OK. Uh, Remy, you have a question for Frank. Okay, hey Frank. Hey, uh, Remy, to nice to see you. Frank, you know me, but for everyone else who doesn't know me, my name is Remy. Um, I'm the founder of NYC Backgammon Club, and it's a massive club that's exploded in New York over the last year, and it's all for young people, 20s and 30s. Um, and something I'm working on right now is so many of my players are so they are so good. They've been playing at home forever and they're really, really good. But a lot of cultures didn't grow up playing with the cube and have never played in a tournament. So I just hosted this a tournament on this past Sunday and it was for 150 people and it, it went really well. And, and all I had five brackets and four of the brackets played with a cube. But I think what I'm like trying to figure out long term is how to get more people more experienced with playing with the cube. And I've been considering like hosting like a chouette teaching night because no one in my group knows how to play chouettes. So is that a good way to go about it of like getting my members like playing with more with a cube? Because at my social events every single week are like, you know, they're like 150 people to 200 people, but it's really social and it's not really meant to be like play with the cube necessarily. So I don't know. What do you think I, how do I uh, grow uh, my members with, you know, kind of getting more experience with the cube? And tournaments. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, by the way, first of all, what and for those of you that don't know, what Remy's doing in New York is just absolutely amazing. I mean, you, you like the amount of players you're getting is incredible, and and you know, just injecting so much energy into the game. Um, so it it is uh, it is a challenge. We have it in San Diego. So yeah. you know, in San Diego, we're we're getting you know, last week we had forty some players at our Wednesday night. I hope we'll have that again uh, tomorrow. Um, and you get players of a lot of different levels, and many that have not have they played a lot, but they haven't played with the cube. Um, I don't know about Chouette. I mean, I think if I, I might take the approach of, if you have the time, have two players that are experienced with the cube, maybe play and talk about the cube while they're playing against each other. And everybody can sort of observe and stop them and say, okay, why, you know, why are you doubling now? Um, you know, 
how come you can't use the cube in this situation and maybe just sort of make it interactive. Chouette is wonderful because it's so social. Um, yeah. But Chouette's got kind of its own rules and nuances to it as well. So that, I don't know, that could feel maybe a little complicated for some new players initially. Yeah. Um, but it would be great to introduce them to Chouette for sure. But I might try it as just more of like a demo with two experienced players and then let everybody just kind of um, watch and where they can do a bit of a tutorial. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I have like plenty of experienced players, obviously in New York, and there's a lot of professionals um, in New York too that are like super supportive and want to help me. Um, but I'm just trying to figure out like the best way because the group is so big now. It's like, okay, how do I spend the time? And of course I'm sending people to the apps and stuff and saying like practice on your game, you know, all of that stuff. But in these social events that I'm putting on every single week, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm, you know, doing everything I can to help my members like improve with the cube. Yeah. So, so it's not just about getting them started using the cube and, and the rules behind using the cube, but also cube strategy. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Cause it's like, you know, really anyone can, they know how to use the cube, like, you know, to use it or not use it, but it's the strategy of like how to really perfect it so that they have enough confidence to want to play in tournaments. Yeah. Um, yeah, again, I think, you know, I don't know how many volunteers you can get. There's obviously a lot of players in New York. And like you said, a lot of the professional players in New York that did, hopefully they come out to your events periodically. So if you could yeah. sort of get them into just some different smaller groups, but it is hard yeah. when you've got you know, 150 players. Yeah. But, th you know, there are definitely differences between how you use the cube in a chouette and how you use the cube in a match. Um, and yeah. That's, that's another thing to think about. That's you know, Remington, I get run into this a lot because I've opened up my tournaments to lower level players. And one of my requirements is that they can use the cube. Um, when I have someone who is never used it at all, I use Kit Woolsey's law, which is before every role, ask yourself, do I have a double? Most of the time, the answer is a very quick, no, I don't. But when I'm working with a new person, I ask them, say it out loud, do I have a double? And they say no, and I say, why not? And it's a very simple answer I'm looking for, nothing complicated. After about, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 times like that, they're ready to learn Pratt. So then I teach them Pratt and I ask them to say, do I have a double run through Pratt, Pratt please? If there's anybody here who doesn't know what that is, I don't wanna go into it right now because it would stop this discussion. Frank, do you think that that is a positive way to go about getting somebody so they're a little bit comfortable with the cube? That is a great, um, so Pratt position, race, and threat is a really good sort of three-prong approach to understanding use of the cube. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a nice, you know, without getting overly technical, it's, a, it's, it's something that I think a lot of people can can relate to because they can kind of sense, oh, am I ahead in the race? Do I have a positional advantage? Am I threatening to win a gammon? And if you use that approach, um, I think people can understand it pretty quickly. I mean, it's not, doesn't give you the right answer every time by any means, but it, I think it goes a long way into guiding decisions, both on the doubling side and the take side. So yeah, I think that, I think it's, I think that that's pretty good. And there's probably some stuff written up on it that could be written up in a in a you know sort of a basic outline way that you might be able to hand out to some of the players or even okay. show them examples. Yeah. Frank. Yes. Frank, I also suggest when when a person wants to double, so look at your opponents. Think about what your opponent might do. Would you if you were on the other side? would you double as your opponent or would you accept as your opponent and think about that aspect of it too yeah so that's sort of the old Woolsey's law which is if you're not sure your opponent has a take you probably have a double um that's a that's a good way to to think about things as well and i also think about um with, without having to go into you know a lot of math or anything about the whole concept of market loss which is you don't want to give the cube away too easily and 
And a lot of newer players think of the cube as just sort of a, a scoring component of the game and not as much of a weapon. So I, I also like to use a football analogy with the cube, which is in backgammon, you don't have to get the ball into the end zone. You, need, you might only need to get it into the red zone before you can actually score. Um, so the cube is a way that, you know, the ownership of it, you don't want to give it away too easily, that it, it, it's, a, it's a weapon. It, it allows its, its strength. It doesn't just represent, you know, a higher stake of the game. It's also this tool, this option that you have at your disposal that's valuable. And I think sometimes early on when people get introduced to the cube, that's not necessarily the way they look at it. So I think that's an important thing to think about. And often I like to, you know, say to, to, to newer players with the cube to imagine if they're thinking about doubling, imagine a two roll sequence. Imagine something that you could roll that's really good and something that your opponent might roll in response that's kind of mediocre. And whether they, you know, how well, how, how far that would advance your position. And if, if they might still have a take after that sequence. And if the answer is they might still have a take anyways, well, then you're probably giving the cube away too early. But um, yeah, so there might be some, there may be some, some material out there that would be a good handout to, to some of the, the newer players. Okay, cool. Great, thanks, Frank. Um, I just put Frank's website in the chat. It's frankfrigo.com. So, if any of this is resonating with you, I know he would enjoy a discussion with you. He does give lessons and he has all sorts of resources. So just giving us a follow-up resource. Um, Candace, since your microphone is working, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Candace, did you still have a question? Candace, can you hear us? Yeah, so ah, ahead. Okay, thank you. My question, Frank, is do you play your opponent? Would you play against me? Should we be across the board from one another? Would you play me differently than you would play against Mochi? Oh, boy, that's a delicate question. Um, so, yes, I would. Um, but you ha but you have to be really careful about this. When actually, when I was at your last tournament and I did the talk with Alex, we talked about this this topic a little bit. And I remember um, having a conversation with Neil Kazaros once upon a time, because I always felt Neil, who those are, some of you may know him, some of you may not, but he's a very accomplished American player. And I always felt like Neil was really good at winning the matches he was supposed to win, where he was a big favorite. And one time I asked him, I said, Neil, when you're playing somebody that you know, you're obviously a big favorite against, how much do you adjust your game? And he said, not much. He said, I just play my best game. He said, and sort of let it happen. Now, that being said, there's definitely circumstances where you want to make adjustments. Um, if I think somebody's a little bit conservative or a little bit aggressive, that's going to affect some of my decisions for sure. If I think I'm a big favorite in a match and there's a large cube coming and there's not a lot left in the game. Maybe it's just converting to a race where there's not much to exploit. I might, you know, I, I, I might let that affect my decision. But, you know, we all know how good XG plays without knowing anything about its opponent, right? That should tell you something. <laughs> now, if XG could profile its opponent, it, it, who knows how much better it might be able to play. I'm sure it would it would be an improvement. But yeah, so I, I do make adjustments, but I you have to be careful because, you know, if you that's that's what's referred to in game theory as um, exploitive play, where you you are just your decisions based on how your opponent might react. And, um, you know, you, you have to be careful because if you over adjust, you end up exploiting yourself. And it's, yeah, but it's then a, for those of us, most of us will be a lesser player than when we face an elite across the board, which we do in side events. What kind of adjustments should we be making if we have to sit across the board from Karen or you or somebody who is clearly significantly better? Well, what I would say, and this is sort of my rule of thumb 
for any player that's hoping to improve is err if you have a close decision err on the side of aggression if you if you're trying to decide between two choices should i go for the gamut shouldn't i go for the gamut should i double should i not double should i take should i pass and you're you're having difficulty deciding you know the, which path to go down at this fork in the road the aggressive side does really well because one thing is if you know you're being perceived if you're playing a top level player and you're being perceived is you know that they think they have an advantage you can get a lot of value sometimes out of being very aggressive you can get them to make mistakes i mean it, anytime you're aggressive with the cube in particular you know with the cube you give your opponent an extra decision which they can they can make a mistake right and you're also increasing variance when you do that which is to say you're you know you're making the value of a game more meaningful you're making the value of your gamins more meaningful and some of that puts some fear into your opponent as well so i would say you know you don't want to be crazy you don't want to give the cube away you don't want to make silly plays but but sort of you know going toward the side of of more of aggressive play is definitely important absolutely important that, that's that's one place you know, that it's good to be that aggressive with a superior player is in the bear off once there's no more contact you and i are equal in rolling the dice and i look for a narrower margin to throw that cube at you than i would against an equal player i want that cube to move when i'm 50 50 with you which is only in the bear off after contact yeah, I mean that's that's the idea behind increasing variance for sure. The only thing I would say there with some caution is if you're giving the cube away and it's a no-brainer decision for me, then it can be too easy. So sometimes you don't want to do it too easily. I mean, it's good to be aggressive, but you don't want to just you know, you don't want to just give it away when if you would have rolled a really good seek back to the point I was making earlier with market loss, if you if you roll well and your and your opponent rolls poorly and they would have had a take anyways, you, you you know you don't want to give it away too soon so but yes that's it's a good thing to be on the lookout for great thanks uh becca thompson has an uh, has a question hey yeah this is a totally different one too but i understand from a little bird that you many of us have asked over the years where did the cube originate and i even did a series of articles about it in mid 2000s in UK and it was always been a mystery and nobody could really pinpoint it but I have heard a rumor that you think you have discovered the original or the originator of the Dublin cube well there's been a few people that have done some research on this topic I happened to come across an article I think it was originally in Harper's Bazaar around 1930 and it has been a mystery um you know th there's two things one is the concept of doubling and the other is the actual doubling cube because there were some early versions of doubling like sticks and dials and things like that match yeah. sticks and dials. but yeah somewhere in the we know in the late 1920s in the new york uh, racket tennis club um their doubling seems to have taken hold and it became it just transformed the game i mean backhand was very popular i think anyways but it doubling took it to it to a whole other level so the story is and it seems to be fairly well documented is that doubling originated in europe at the travelers club in paris um and in one of the articles, it specifically points to um, a game that was being played between some Danish aristocrat and a guy by the name of Grand Duke Dimitri. And I don't know if any of you know who Grand Duke Dimitri is, but he was part of Russian royalty. He was a co-conspirator in the murder of Rasputin. And then, uh, you know, most of his family was wiped out. He moved to the U.S. He was a socialite. And then apparently he started playing in New York and introduced the idea of doubling and then it, it sort of took hold there. I don't know that that's 100% accurate, but it is um, attributed to him in some way. I mean, the concept of doubling may have started to surface other places, but he seems to be the one that's that's connected to bringing the idea from Europe into the US. Okay, thank you. 
because I've seen pictures too of what's her name that one of the early authors who actually you guys was a woman. She wrote a backgammon book in was it the twenties? Hedda, whatever. Well, Hatterley, yeah. Yeah, from New York, and there's a picture of her teaching the cube to other women in the club there. Um, so I was like, "Whoa, that's great! She's a you know early pioneer for women." Um, oh, well, yeah. oh, thank you very much, Frank. If anybody wants to dig into that history a little bit deeper, check out our YouTube channel because uh, Albert Stagg was a visitor recently to the Women of Backgammon and shared a lot of information on history. Yeah, Albert Stegg has this online with the New England Backgammon Club has this online museum archives of it's it's amazing what he's put together and how well organized it is. It's really entertaining. Great. Uh, Angela, you have a question. Hi, um, I am brand new to um, Backgammon and I'm very excited that there's a bunch of women and Frank talking to me tonight about a game I have loved since I was nine years old. Um, I live in St. Louis, Missouri, and um, my uncle had taught me how to play when I was nine, and I would beg him and my dad to play, and then every guy I dated and my husband was required to play on the <laughs> amazing leather board that my uncle, who was an engineer and lived in Seattle, actually built for me made it's gorgeous it's huge it's and it had a doubling cube i assume that's what you guys are talking about and i know how to use it if that's what you're referring to i couldn't believe it um like a few weeks ago i was like i wonder if st louis missouri has a backgammon club and lo and behold it is five minutes or less from my home so my question is before i walk into that club um, what app am I wanting to play on? What am I wanting to read? What do I need to do that? Because I know I am against on, on the app Backgammon NJ, which is one I had just chose years ago. Um, I hold my own. But what do I want to do before I walk into that club, please? Well, there's a lot of really good information. I mean, through the USBGF, um, Backgammon Galaxy has a lot of great instructional videos. Alex Ashigian's uh, channel on YouTube. This is a lot of like, you know. I don't know any of it. Alex, yeah, you? So, uh, Alex Ashigian, he's a player in uh, Los Angeles and a prolific poster of educational backgammon videos. It seems like there's a new one coming out every day. I don't know how he has the time, but he does amazing stuff. Um, I just did an interview with him just a little bit ago, but he has a lot of great educational materials. So does Mark Olson. So if you go to the YouTube, um, you can put in Backgammon Galaxy. You can okay. put in um, uh, Alex Ashigian Backgammon. Um, and there's different levels of instruction, but th there's some great material there. There's, an, there's a number of excellent books. Um, and I'm sure April and Karen through the USBGF could steer you towards a, a bunch of resources that they have for people that are, you know, trying to improve in the game as well. Angela, please join the Facebook group for the women of backgammon here for our US. We have tons of resources. We will answer a question like that. We will send you, I will send you an, a, link, a link immediately about any of the questions that have been asked tonight. And I would, we'd love to have you in there. We have tons of resources that make it simple and handouts and, you know, articles, whatever you need. Please Great. join. Well, I will join. It'll be under, I don't do anything on Facebook or any social media, but I will um, join. I have a fake account under Fan of Summer just to see friends, kids and stuff. So I will join. And I know I'm going to see you ladies at future tournaments because I am beyond excited to have found this backgammon federation and a local club, and I am been so excited. So thank you. And I'll just add, Angela, you probably have everything you need today to go to the club. Great. Like, don't be scared to go 
Um, I was just looking it up. I just posted a link to the St. Louis Back Emmet Club. It's run by Jim Fair. He is wonderful. I would just give him a call and let him know you're coming. Okay. On and ask him. Usually, most clubs are so welcoming, and right. um, it's usually just a great experience. Like uh, you sound like me about nine years ago, okay. where <laughs> where I found out there was a back Emmet Club that was a couple of miles from my house. And I was so excited and I was so nervous to go. What are these people gonna be like? What, you know, ah, all those questions. And I'm so glad we did. We, we right. walked into the club and we haven't missed a week since and just, we got exposed to this wonderful community. So um, don't feel like you don't already have what it takes to go, just, just go. Thank you. I just didn't wanna like possibly not be a good opponent I think I actually probably am pretty good is my guess. I, I really do. I'm guessing I am good. I just didn't, I don't really know. Like, um, like you said, five games, the app I do has seven. And I thought, well, if I don't know certain rules, like when I went on that, um, the official site, I'm like, oh, these arrows have numbers to them. Like, I didn't know that, like when I was, in, but I did get the move right on the website. So anyway, I really have been just beyond excited that there is a club. I didn't even know it in St. Louis. And I, I promise I'm going to see you ladies at tournaments. All right. Go and report back. <laughs> Let us know how it goes. All right. Thank you so much. A Angela, I, I want to say that we've all had a first at a back end of the club. <laughs> yes. we, were all, we were all in your same place, nervous, didn't know what to do, how to do. And the cube, by the way, is whenever anyone learns about the game, the first thing they ask is, what is that? <laughs> it's like they want to know what that is to begin with. And it's like, no, 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 you don't want to go there yet. <laughs> Very good. Well, but, I'll, find, I'll find out if I'm decent soon enough. Yes. Yes, <laughs> you will definitely learn a lot. And don't be afraid to ask who you think of the better players in the game and all, all of them I'm sure are more women than men more men than what men there's 19 women. guys I think it was when I looked it up it's just a group of guys which is no problem I flew planes in college I love to get on a crafts game I love driving a Porsche on a racetrack anything the guys are doing this is the girl that wants to be there with them okay and don't be afraid to ask questions okay. men love men love to talk to women about <laughs> about any game about any game so just just stroll up to a man and say i'm learning the game tell me a little something something okay tell them what's what all right Very good. <laughs> so thank you so much we have a few um people in line frank but i just want to do a time check and see how much longer you can hang out with us i, I i'm okay I'm, I'm okay I'm good. all right just let us know let us know all right uh lissy you're next Hi, I'm Lissy. I'm super grateful to be here. Um, seems like a really great supportive group. I'm coming as a member of New York City Backgammon Club with Remy. Um, the question that I have is one that I've had for, um, for several months now, which is objectively, how do I know how good I am? So people ask me, you know, how long have you been playing backgammon? The answer is, four years I learned during the pandemic. Um, but yeah, like I would force boyfriends to play with me. And then I found Remy's uh, club on Reddit and then, you know, came and then there were various levels. Um, and I think the question became more pronounced when she started doing tournaments. So the first tournament I did just for simplicity, um, I was level two out of five is where I entered because it was the lowest level with the doubling cube. I was just learning to use that. And then I felt like, OK, so this mathematician just kicked my butt because he shouldn't be in this level two out of five. Right. Um, so it's kind of a two part question, which is. Like, how do I know objectively how good I am? Like, is there a number of games I need to play? Like, do I have to record it in some way? Um, is there an easy tool to figure this out? Is there a ranking system? Is there a point system? Um, because I did end up on the next tournament going three out of five. 
And I felt like I put up a fight and everyone was just as good. And, you know, it was actually challenging for each other, all the opponents that I played. So, um, so, so yeah, statistically, like how many games do I have to play? How do I know objectively how good I am? And then I guess on behalf of Remy, how can she be sure that the people who are entering her tournaments are in that right level? Um, you know, if she's offering beginner level tournaments at the same time as advanced and expert. So uh, would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So there's a, there's a few different things that, that come to mind. So backgammon is, you know, unique in that we have a lot of different skill level divisions and big tournaments. So at Candace's tournament in June, I know Candace, you have three levels, I guess, is that right? And in, in, in the New York Open, I think they've got four maybe or something like that. Um, so the tournament directors do have some criteria based upon experience that the player has, but that, you know, it, it, can, it gets pretty subjective, right? Um, you know, we, we will, people can play above their level, but you don't want people to play below their level, right? Because that sort of ruins the, the feeling of, you know, competition for everyone. Um, there have been different rating systems, you know, clubs like it's in San Diego, we have a, you know, kind of our own master point system and we do an ELO ranking, which I don't know if you, many of you are familiar with ELOs, but ELOs is basically a, a rating system. Everybody starts at 1500 and you then, um, based on whether you win or lose and the length of the match and the strength of your opponent, you, you win or lose ELO points. And if you get enough matches, ELOs can be really good ranking systems. Um, the quickest way to get an objective measurement of your level of play, and I say this with some reservation because it, um, it can be a little humbling at times, but if you take like extreme gamma and, and you play a match against it, it does a very objective performance rating, not based on whether you won or lost, but on the quality of your decisions and what it thinks you were doing in terms of making optimal plays or suboptimal plays, it'll grade your play. And if you really want to know where you stand, that's probably going to be the most precise way to do it. But, um, you know, it that doesn't mean, you know, I mean, somebody could go out and they've never, they, they have very low experience. And the, the, the lower the performance rating number, the better it is. And, you know, there's some players when they're starting out, they may have a very high number, but that doesn't, you know, it's a journey, right? You're improving. And the whole idea is to use a tool like that to get better and better. So when I say I say it with reservation, I don't want people to go and, and play extreme gaming for the first time and get a number and go, oh my God, I'm terrible. You know, I, I, I don't want to play this game because, you know, it's, we, we love the game for lots of, of different reasons. So um, I mean, I think a couple of the tournament directors that are on the call could could kind of weigh in on this, but that would be the most direct short term way to get a sense of your level of play. Um, and those numbers, those performance ratings correspond somewhat to the levels of play people play in tournaments. Um, so. And by the way, it, it, anybody, it, it really you need a piece there is a there is an app a phone app for um extreme gammon it's very inexpensive you can buy it in the app store the full version really requires a pc to download it and it's it is the best learning tool that you will ever find to really you know get better at the game and and um you won't necessarily know the whys of your mistakes but you'll it'll flag them and you'll get an idea of kind of where you're giving up value in your decisions. And the mobile app is available on all platforms, but unfortunately I'm one of those that have been waiting and was promised 12 years ago by the developers of Extreme Game. And don't worry, the Mac version's coming right out and it just isn't happening, but it does help. It, it does help a little bit. You just can't put things into it the way you can on the PC version. That's right. And I don't hold your breath that the Mac version is ever going to come out. I, I know Xavier, the creator of it, and he's he's not in the process of developing it. No, <laughs> so, never has. Unless somebody else takes it over. But um, if you have access to a PC, um, it's really worth it. The other thing is... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Lissy and, and 
whoever else is here from New York City Black Emma Club, I, I play at a lot of her socials and I usually give lessons. So if you can find in between players, because I play a lot of the players and comment on their games, et cetera. So if you can find me at one of, at one of the socials, come up and play me and I can give you some gauge of where your game is and that would be helpful. Thank you, Antoinette. I'll yeah, definitely a, find you. Okay. All right. Yeah. And, and there's no shame. Miss me. I'm, the, I'm the only chocolate person there. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. That is not true at all. <laughs> there may be one other. <laughs> no, that is not true. It is growing, but okay. you're definitely the most famous. So no one all misses right, you. But, but look for me. Okay. And Lizzie. Um, I'm a director of the Viking Classic, and we usually tell people if it's their first tournament or they're just coming in, there is no shame in starting out at the very lowest level. You're just dipping your toes in. Start there. See how it feels. You know, it sounds like you have a good feeling of what the competition is, and it's going to depend on what club you're at like what the level of competition is what tournament some tournaments have more stronger players than others so just start out just you know dip your toes in see how it feels you don't want it to be too easy you know you'll you'll be able to feel that if it's too easy but you'll also be able to feel like if you're be getting beat up so I think it's just a matter of kind of you know dipping your toes in giving your chance to kind of settle in and and uh, feel your way through it Frank, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, obviously, in your professional life, uh, you develop quantitative models to predict success, whether that's runs uh, or yards gained or touchdowns or whatever. And I'm curious about the potential to apply those analytic methods to backgammon. I was intrigued when you talked about uh, using a camera to photograph positions where you're not sure what's the right right decision. And I'm really thrilled by that because I'm on a kick that the best way to improve your game is to really study your own weaknesses and your own mistakes. But it's one thing to do it position by position as you play matches, and it's another to accumulate a database with patterns so you see um or i see in my case my biggest uh cube error is missing a double um or leaving too many blots lying around it is a big one on the checker errors but um i'm wondering whether you've tried doing or thought about doing quantitative analysis of patterns of errors blunders at equity loss either for yourself or for your opponents yeah i um yes so one of the things that i i do try to pay attention to is if my matches are recorded and i get an overall performance rating on the match and then I can scroll through and see you know where I made um, suboptimal decisions is to look for patterns of like where I'm giving up value and 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 again as I mentioned earlier thinking about what was my thought process over the board what was I thinking about when I was in the moment and then where am I I have gone astray and I find, you know, like you give you a couple of, of examples. I find that if I'm a little bit tired, I get impatient. And when I get impatient, I might do things like get lazy about keeping track of the race. Or I might get lazy about considering who said it earlier that, you know, I think Candace mentioned it that, you know, when you're thinking about using the cube, ask yourself, get in the habit of asking yourself, could I possibly have a cube here? Um, I find that, you know, one of my mistakes will be sometimes is I didn't even pause to think about the cube. I didn't even recognize that there was a decision, right? So 
I think yes, you you can find that 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 a lot of times mistakes fall into different categories. And what I like to do is is go for the chunkier ones first, right? The where the big blunders. Where am I giving up most of the value, and and sort of working my way um, down from there? Like I used to, I, I used to feel like I gave up a lot of value in DMP games, where where the match is down to just a single point, gamins don't matter, and I and it's amazing how often matches become DMPs. So it's imp- and and a small mistake in a DMP gets amplified. So I really started focusing on those kinds of things, but. But there is nothing better than recording your decisions in a live match and going back and analyzing them and then really sort of breaking down where you might be giving up value. I think it's 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 really the best, best way to learn. For any of y'all that use that game in studio, which we have to play on Heroes, you know, every month. If you go to the original backgammonstudio.com, there, it's a little daunting if you don't know how to navigate it, but I can send you a link for that too. But there are, you know, you can decide what the weak part of your game is. If it's ace point games or in the bear off moving wrong, check, checkers the wrong way. And if you go to a, any particular section, they have probably what, 400 different topics and you can play uh, a bunch of drills that do nothing but help that part of your game. Um, and that's super helpful. Really, really helpful if you can find it. It's hard finding it on the old studio, but I'm happy to help anybody with that too, because that is, that really helped me. And that also helped me. I kept, I noticed I kept uh, getting stuck years ago. I would always get stuck in my opponent's home and that's really bad. That you can't win that way. And whether it's the midpoint of your game, whatever. Um, you will quickly work through, you know, and strengthen those weaknesses at studio with their drills and just targeting your specific need in your game. Great. Thanks, Becca. We have Marsha or Marcia next. I think you might be muted. I think you're muted. She's unmuted. Let's see. We can't hear you though, Marsha. Hmm. Yeah, I think you're having audio issues. Maybe you type know, your question in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. We have Lisa Spear next. Go ahead, Lisa. I'd like and to ask Frank, how long have you been playing this game? Oh, I started in 1980. Eight what? <laughs> <laughs> 1980. Yeah, it was okay. the first year I started playing. Yeah, first time I played in a tournament. Yeah. Karen, Karen, how long have you been playing this game? Karen? About the same. I started uh, in 82. 82. Okay. I've I've been playing this game for 50 years. And I think each of us has not learned as much today. We've, We've learned a lot, but we're still learning. That's the important thing. You're never gonna get to where you should be before you get there. So you have to start out in the beginning. Don't get discouraged. We've all been there, done that. And we're learning how to control that each time we play. So don't be discouraged. Get your feet wet. Yeah, that, I agree. And that's the point I was trying to make about, you know, if you do get connected with Extreme Gammon and rate your play, is enjoy the journey. You know, it's a lot, I mean, the, for, for me, the most fun part about this game, and there's a lot of fun aspects of the game, but I just like the, you know, the intellectual challenge of it. It's just enjoyable, it's stimulating, and, you know, every incremental improvement is enjoyable. I I, I liken it to, 
you know, playing a musical instrument, right? You don't have to write a concerto on, on day one. <laughs> you know, you just enjoy every step. Um, and that, that, and that, and then you just, you know, you, you stay passionate, enthusiastic about the game, and um, and the improvements will will come on their own. And you're gonna you're gonna get to the point where you beat one of us, and it's like, oh my God, I'm like really learning something. It's like any of us can be beaten. You have that luck factor as well. Don't forget the luck. And no matter how good the player is. We can be beaten. Absolutely. So be encouraged. Be encouraged. Um, was it uh, Marsha that? Yeah. So I saw your text come up about. I think did did it say what could make the tournament experience more enjoyable? Was that it? I can read it because like we can't still can't hear you. Uh, she says, "How do we make the tournament?" environment more enjoyable for everyone. I find usually older men try to intimidate me rolling before my dice are picked up or talking with spectators in other language, et cetera. So I think Frank will give you a chance, yeah. but I think the ladies probably have some good advice too for Marcia. I mean, I can just speak from the perspective of co-directing the, the San Diego club. That was something that when we decided to resurrect the club and we wanted to really broaden it out to encourage a lot of different players to show up that we were really conscious of. Because um, it should be fun for everybody. And, you know, let's face it, it's a game that has some eccentric people and <laughs> maybe more of the rule than the exception. Um, and, you know, but there's a lot of really interesting characters and a lot of really fun people that play. That's it, it, it makes it fun. But with that, you know, you also get some different types that can, can interrupt the enjoyment of the experience as well. So, you know, it's just like anything, you're going to deal with different personality types. And I know as a director of our club, you know, we have had to ask a couple of people politely to step away. And if they're just, if they're not, conducive to the environment, then they shouldn't be playing there. And and we try to really kind of keep our eyes open for that. Um, so, um, yeah, so it, I think, you know, from the director standpoint, just to really keep your eyes open for that, because you don't want people to, to show up the first time and have an unpleasant experience because of another player. It's just, it, that would it'd be really unfortunate. So, um, you know, we really try to take the approach of if you're a new player and you're playing a more experienced player that, you know, like, you know, I've played players that didn't know to hit the clock and I'm not going to let them lose on time, right? I mean, I'm going to tell them you need to hit your clock or, you know, I'll pause I don't, I'm not offering unsolicited advice unless they ask, you know, they ask for something, but just, you know, it, it, I think you just have to sort of get, cultivate that, that culture of, of, you know, everybody cooperating. So I know with us, we try to get some of our more experienced players all on the same page. Like when you see a new player walk in, go introduce yourself to them um, and, you know, ask them if they have any questions. You know, are you familiar with the tournament rules? Can I sit down? So everybody just feels like they're part of it and it doesn't all land on the tournament director. So the more you can sort of have those people in your group that are on the lookout, and I'll often have somebody come up to me and say, hey, you know, you may want to, something's going on over here and you may want to keep an eye on this and we'll have somebody walk over and, and take a look. But, you know, you can't eliminate it. I mean, you have a lot of different personalities. It's an emotional game and it's going to happen, but hopefully, you know, few and far between. Oh, she said she's spoken up to the director and feel brushed off. I think that's a different problem then um, because it's not really our job to manage other players' behavior, right? And I've learned to go to the director because that's really what they're there for. Um, you know, if the director is not helping you, you know, try making friends with some of the other players. There might be players that will correct 
that particular person's behavior and help stand up for you. I know that that has happened in my case. Um, another thing you could do is really know the rules. You know, I was zeroed in on your um, fast grab uh, situation and the new, if, if your club is playing by the USBGF rules, there are some new rules that rolled out this year that punish players for grabbing their dice too fast. And they can either lose a good roll or they can lose their time. You can look it up. I don't want to go on the technicalities here, but but like really educating yourself and knowing the rules and, and don't let them get away with that that behavior. But but it's it's tough. Um, it can help to invite other women in. Um, I know with my club, they weren't the guys weren't used to playing women, right? And and um, it was kind of a boys club atmosphere. But now after a few years, it's completely turned around. There's a lot more women in the club. You know, you get a variety of uh, you know different genders, different ages. It it just helps to strengthen and expand. Um, but I know it can be it can be tough and it can be discouraging. Um, connect with us because there is a larger group and a larger community that is here to support you and wants you to keep playing backgammon. So good questions. I was just going to go off um, of that and just give my perspective of starting a club from nothing a year ago. And so. I think I really set the tone of my club first was making it really social and fun and making sure that the focus is meeting new people and improving your game and there's no money involved in my social events. And so setting that aspect of like, it's really about building a community first and then improving your game. And then now we're working towards tor tournaments and, and kind of growing that that level. But it really starts with the person who is, you know, running the club or the tournaments and really setting the tone for the culture, making it inviting for everybody. Um, and the tournament I just had on Sunday was absolutely split half and half, 50, 50 men and women. And so that's something that I'm working on is really making sure that women feel comfortable to play in tournaments. Um, and, and mine are fun. So a, a lot of people come and, and it's a good time, but they take it seriously, but it's still about fun first. So that's just a little bit of, you know, my experience. That's nice. great. You could start your own club. <laughs> you know, then you get to say. <laughs> also, inviting people to your house, too, can help. Inviting select people that you know are good to be around and will be a positive. Um, it'll be a positive experience. Sometimes that's nice just to start <laughs> with a small group. Um, yeah. And I've started three clubs in three different states over 20 years some with more success than others and also running the leagues in uk for gammonitis and it it takes a while to build it but it and it's daunting at first but there are a lot more of us out there than we think and you guys don't be scared to put your foot down about because i can't believe you have people fast rolling or you know going before you've picked up your dice in a tournament setting in abt or usbgf you could, you know, give them a warning, say, knock it off. And then you call someone over and you get during a lot of things like that. If people do are get, going against the rules, you know, they have, you have a choice. They either have to, uh, you get to choose whether that they have to play that or you have to make, you can make them re-roll. So, you know, and they love to take advantage of new players. Sometimes some of the older, especially mm -hmm. guys, no offense to the men, but I've seen a lot. And it's just not cool at all. I had one guy that coaxed me into touching his cube. He said, look at this beautiful cube I just ordered from blah, blah. And I reached over and I touched it. And he said, oh, you touched it, you cubed. And I'm like, what a dirty trick. You know, and he was in my own club. And he, I was already outgunned. And he was a much better player. But taking advantage of that kind of stuff is not OK. Anyway, sorry. For sure. All right, uh, so thanks to everyone from Remy's Club that came in. This is really cool to see you guys here. Um, I did put a link in the chat. If anyone isn't already connected to us, we send out invitations to these sessions. So if you would like to get invited to a future session, I just put a link in the chat. You can go ahead and stick your email in our forum and we'll 
um, put you on our list. Right. Who I is know. next? Go ahead, Antoinette. I know that there are a lot of, uh, there were a lot of and are a lot of questions, but I want to know if you have any other suggestions. I know we didn't finish your lecture part, I'm sure with all the questions that we had. So I wanna know if you have anything that you'd like to close with. Um, uh, I don't know. I think, we, I think we've covered um, a, a bunch of ground. I mean, there's obviously a lot of different ways um, to improve at the game and there's a lot of great resources out there. And it sounds like there's been a lot of exchange in the, in the chat box and beyond for s some of those resources, but there really is a lot of great stuff out there um, for improving play and, um, and also just for connecting with the various communities, the regional clubs, the, you know, the various tournaments. I mean, you know, we're talking a lot about backgammon at the regional level, but, there is an international community of backgammon and just some amazing tournaments around the world. So, so one thing that, I mean, that's really one of the great joys, like I'm going to Europe this summer and, and it's just what a great way to reconnect with players from all over the world that I've known for years. It's, it's one of the real joys of going to tournaments is just so to meet a lot of interesting people. And, um, and, uh, yeah, and you know, and I've sensed even you know at our club now a lot of the the newer players saying that you know they're really looking forward to going to some of these events in the future, and um, so it's a it's a great game, um, and uh, I don't think there's anything quite like it from you know the intellectual challenge, the aesthetic, the excitement, the venues, um, the interesting people. Um, it's yeah, you're part of a really cool community. Very much so. True. Yes, I, I think true. you're right, Frank. I think there's backgammon all over the world. Anywhere you live or any place that you're going, you can look, you can research on Google where the tournaments are being held, or you can look on ChicagoPoint.com. Cal Joy Cole puts out every tournament in every city and state and, and outside the US as well. We have a few more questions. Me too, okay. it's been such a lively discussion. Uh, it looks like we have two more questions and maybe we'll take the last two and then, and then wrap it up. But it has been such a lively discussion and I appreciate each and every one of you for coming and participating. It's just been so much fun. Uh, and not being afraid to ask questions. For sure. All right, let's uh, let's take Lisa Spear, and then after that, uh, we'll invite Laura. So, Lisa, go ahead. So you're off mute, but we're not hearing you, Lisa. Yeah, I wonder if your microphone's not working. Go ahead and type your question in the chat. And in the meantime, can we take the the other hand that's raised? Yeah, let's go ahead and take Laura. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yep. Okay. Hi, this is Lara. Um, I'm in Houston, Texas. Thanks, uh, Frank, for spending your evening with us or some of it. Um, my question is, I'm new to backgammon. Um, I learned poker over COVID online. And then when I went to go play poker in real life, um, I found I didn't know much about how the etiquette and, and certain gameplay and different things that are going on. Um, and so that was just a big a big challenge for me. So I wonder if I mean I I play backhand in, in person, but I wondered if going from playing regular games to playing tournament play, if there was specific etiquette or different faux pas or things you should or shouldn't do, or I don't know a a way I can kind of learn about those different intricacies. Yeah, that that's a commonly asked question for people that 
you know, to start to play in, in tournaments. Um, whatever it, it is, you know, it can be picked up very, very quickly um, in terms of clock usage, dice rolling, you know, what constitutes a legal role, the rules and etiquette of the game. I think the best way is, you know, you go to your local club and you just get used to playing over the board. And if you have any questions, you ask the director, um, or usually there's even rules that are posted in advance. I'm sure like, you know, Candace, with your term, and I imagine you post your, or you include USBGF rules or something in there. So you can get a pretty good sense in advance of what some of the rules and etiquette are, but it's really not complicated. I mean, it's you, you'll get used to that very, very quickly and comfortable with it. But it can seem a little awkward at first when you're not used to it. Because, you know, your point about poker, I, I've played a few poker tournaments and I, not very frequently, but I get a little uncomfortable sometimes with some of the, you know, how you're supposed to handle the cards and when your bet goes in and so forth. And just because I wasn't used to it. But yeah, that won't that should shouldn't be a problem at all for you. You'll you'll pick that up very quickly. Okay. And does anybody want to comment if there's good resources on that that in advance, like through the USBGF or anything? I, I just put a link in the chat. Um, we have a guide to attending your first ABT. And I it's not exactly an etiquette guide, but it kind of gives you an overview of how tournaments work. I I don't think we do a good enough job really explaining to new players like what to expect, how do I do this? And so this is our first attempt at um, really explaining that, but um, certainly open to feedback if if you need more information too. By the way, and I just thought of an, oh, sorry, sorry, I just thought of another resource. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. It, it, some of you may have seen a, a, the YouTube channel for uh, blunder blots. Uh, it's a couple from Madison, Wisconsin. They do amazing content of tournament experience. And I think they've posted videos of the first time they went to an organized tournament and their experience with it. It would give you a bit of a flavor, I think. I don't know if they get into all of rules and etiquette and so forth, but it's it's very entertaining and it'll kind of give you the feel. Um, they, they capture a lot of the excitement. They're great. So, I'll try to find the link. Yeah. By the way, if you're in Houston, um, one of the best tournaments in the U.S. is every early February in San Antonio, the Texas Backgammon Championships. Super well run, really enjoyable event. Oh, no kidding. Good to know. It's it's called the what? The Texas Backgammon Championships? Yeah, I think the website's just texasbackgammon.com, um, but it's a big tournament that runs every, uh, it's usually Super Bowl weekend. It's okay. Super Bowl weekend every year, and even folks from Europe come and attend. You know, Michi and Mochi are often there, all the greatest players. It's, yeah, I helped run it for a lot of years, and it's, I've been out of it a while, but it, it has grown immensely, and it's so much fun. 2017, first woman ever to win that tournament. There you go, girl. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's great. I think that's all for this evening. Frank, I really want to thank you for stepping up, stepping in. Much oh, thank you. This was, this was really fun. I, it's great to see all the all the interest and enthusiasm. So hope yes. to see you all at a tournament sometime soon. Yes, and all the questions that have been asked and I hope answered. So thank you, yes. Frank. Feel Many thanks, everybody. USBGF, if you have any additional questions, we'll be happy to answer any of them. So good yeah, night, we'll, everyone. Good night. Right, we'll post this on YouTube you. a little bit later. All right. Bye-bye. We'll, we'll see you. Looking forward to seeing you, Frank, you and Stephanie in Monte Carlo. All right. Take care. All right. Good, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. See good you night. in September for Jonah's interview.